Yo, what up, my boy? Welcome to my first video. My name is Ski Mask Bro, and today I'm going to be walking you guys through how to build an LBO model from scratch. So basically, we're going to be trying to solve a 90-minute case study that I've received during one of my off-cycle P interview processes. And obviously, it's anonymized, and I've changed a few variables around, but in essence, it's still the same. And basically, in this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of provide you guys with a proven algorithm that's worked for me and a template that you guys could build from scratch that could help you guys complete your Excel test in a timely manner. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to try and convey like the various complexities of an LBO model to you guys, such as your DPLs and your Goodwill step ups and things like that. And the third thing is ultimately, I hope you guys could utilize this potentially as a blueprint to ultimately just nail your various LBO tests and your modeling tests and things like that and the technical portions of your PE interviews. And I know I look kind of sus right now, but for some background, I graduated from non-target school. I'm wrapping up my third year in investment banking, and this summer I'm going to be heading off to an upper middle market private equity fund to start my career in investing. So I've just recently finished off my recruiting process a few months ago, and honestly, one of the biggest issues that I had was that there wasn't a lot of free resources on YouTube to teach you how to model because most of it was behind things like paywalls and stuff. Stuff and you really needed to pay out of pocket for these big programs, uh, but there wasn't really necessarily any supplemental videos to help you fill knowledge gaps in the time being whenever you're confused. So the reason I'm creating this video is to ultimately help you provide you guys with a different perspective and a way of doing things when it comes to modeling that you guys could potentially use as a blueprint in your process. So I think with that said, let's get started and hop straight into the case study. So here we're going to be evaluating Ski Mask Company. We're going to be assuming an entry and exit multiple of 12 times with various leverage assumptions. And when you guys have a moment, just take a screenshot of this because I'm going to exit out of this and then start building this out on an Excel. But anyways, as a briefing and a summary or leverage assumptions, this is going to basically be a three-statement LBO model utilizing two tranches of leverage. One is going to be your typical term loan, and the other one is going to be pick interest, which is going to be accumulating until the end of, um, until your exit period, basically. And then here, you're going to have your various transaction assumptions, and the complexities here is basically your management rollover proceeds, your management incentive pool, and also the details and the asset step up that's going to occur as a result of the transaction and then you're here you're going to have some basic financial forecast and also a pre-transaction balance sheet that you're going to have to adjust in order to project your balance sheet on a go forward basis and i think basically the framework when it comes to building out models like these is that you got to break it out into five different steps i think the first two steps is what we're going to be covering in part one of this video which is aligning your transaction assumptions as well as creating your sources and uses and then in the second part of this video, on the next video, we're going to be really focusing in on the PL forecast as well as the balance sheet adjustments and your cash flow statement. And then in the last piece of this video, we're going to be focusing on the returns analysis where we're going to be sort of building out the returns waterfall when it comes to incentive structures and stuff like that. And ultimately calculating your IRR and your money on money return, which essentially gets you the answer to this case study, which is what is your, your return going to be at the end of 2020? 26, assuming an exit, what's your IRR going to be based on the amount of capital that you've invested? So that said, just take a screenshot of this. I'm going to move this off my screen and we're going to go straight into an Excel to set up sort of the transaction assumptions and then going into the sources and uses. Hmm. So basically, you guys always will start off with a blank Excel sheet. And what you're going to see is you're just going to see normally you're going to have your Calibri font. I've already changed the Arial. And what you want to do within the first two seconds is that you just want to sort of change your font size to 10. Go to column A, B, make the font size, make the column width 1. Highlight column C all the way to column K and make it sort of column width 10. You're basically going to expand it open. And basically for any test of the five-year projection period, you're basically going to use column C to column K and nothing more. And the reason that I'd like to do it this specific way is that like when you're doing a modeling test, sometimes like when you're formatting things, you realize things are too crowded, it doesn't look good, and then you end up with a messy format. And basically this gives you enough space where you can spread your numbers out so it's laid out neatly but not too spread out where it looks like there's a lot of white space all over the place. So it 
looks like a legitimate financial model, even though you guys have completed it within a very sort of limited, like within a very limited time frame. And the reason that I like to sort of do it like this is that basically the first thing you gotta remember is you just come into the sheet, change the column width, and you're just remembering that you're keeping everything within C to K. And that way it takes the thought out of it when you've done enough practices so that you don't need to sort of worry about formatting in the modeling test. You're just on all pilot and you're just populating things in. So, so once we do that, we're basically gonna sort of create a title or it's gonna call it, be called Ski Mask Company add a little bottom border. I think my colors are messed up, so just let me change it. So Alt HBO, bold it, and you're gonna come to column F and you're gonna do 2021 equals plus one. You're gonna move everything through to 2026. And basically what we're gonna do here before we do anything else is we're gonna sort of change the number format because the most common number format in any model that you're gonna do is you're just gonna have like the regular number with no dollar sign, no percentage sign, just the sort of regular number format that you guys have. So basically what we're saying is that in this format, we're just saying that give me sort of, oh, oops, I forgot the semicolon. Like if the number is negative, put it in parentheses for me. If it's zero, just give me dot dot, like dash dash. And then if it's positive, just sort of put a little space on the right hand side. So I'm gonna do this, but obviously the dates can be like a regular number format, but then that's just to change the rest of the sheet so we don't have to sort of waste time formatting it. So we're gonna change this, and now we're gonna to come to here. It's gonna be general, and then A. F4 to repeat the previous action, but instead of actuals, we're gonna do expected. Because for the ski mask company, like on the PowerPoint you saw before, we're assuming an entry at the end of 21. So we're gonna acquire the company at the end, like December 31st, 2021, and we're assuming an exit at December 31st, 2026. So an exit at the end, 26. Now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna make it look a little bit nicer. Sort of add just the white borders, center, and then Alt W V G to remove the grid lines. And now once we have this, we're just gonna come up here to the first row, and then Alt W F R to just freeze the top row, so that once we scroll up and down, this top row remains consistent. And the reason we do that is because basically for this three statement LBO model, we're gonna be building it all on one sheet. So we're not gonna be using a separate sheet. So when you guys scroll down, once the model gets a little bit more completed and longer, you guys could sort of just reference like the years without needing to copy and paste this 20 plus times into each category. And now before we go any further, another thing that I really like to do is I just sort of like to create four different number of formats here. And basically this is gonna be our dollar sign we're gonna be using this sort of as a quote unquote format painter. So at the end of the model, when you're reformatting what you have, you can sort of just come up here and just copy the format so that's quick and efficient. So you're not scrambling for time. And I know this seems like a lot of sort of work up front, but then it's gonna be worth it at the end. Once you realize that it sort of increases your speed and it takes away a lot of sort of like the individual times that you're gonna be using to manipulate the other variables. So now we have the regular format, dollar sign, percentage, and then sort of the multiple. And now you're gonna have color, color. We're gonna be just using one color. And here we're just gonna be using like some variation of dark blue. We're not gonna be using green here because we don't have any sort of external linking sheets. So we're just gonna have blue for the hard codes that we're gonna number format into various things. Okay, so now with that said, we can go straight into building our model. And by the way, like I'm doing this very slowly, but then like this whole piece up here can be done within like the first 20 seconds you guys open up your Excel. It just takes a little bit of practice, but you guys will be fast soon at it once you guys just get a few reps in. So basically what I like to do is I just like to sort of break out the various pieces of the model into like different pieces so it's easy to follow. And I know that like for a 90 minute case study when you have a lot of things in there, like it might not be efficient for you guys to go about and sort of um, 
make it look pretty and stuff like that, which I totally understand. But for most of the time, like, you guys want to make it look somewhat presentable. Because, like, at the end of the day, like, a model is just a check-the-box thing. But then it could give you an advantage if it's better than a lot of the other people's. Which I think you should invest, like, some effort into making it look nice. Because then that way, when you're interviewing for, like, one of the more popular funds, like, they will keep you in the running. Versus just cutting you off for someone else that they liked a little bit better and stuff like that. So... So now you have your transaction assumptions. And then based on the PowerPoint that I shared before, here are sort of like the different stuff that we had. So we have the entry multiple, the exit multiple, the tax rate, the rollover of proceeds, the management incentive pool, the minimum cash balance. So basically your cash to your balance sheet, your transaction fees, which is gonna be a percentage of EV, and then your amortization, which can be applied to both your financing fees as well as the unwinding of your deferred tax liabilities. And now you have to step up in your assets post acquisition for the goodwill, which is ultimately going to create your details, which we'll get into later. So we're going to just come into column F. That's going to be like the first piece where we're going to have like um, various like like numbers populating. So let me see, minimum cash of 10, transaction fee of 1%, amortization of 10%, and then your step up of 10%. And the reason why we have this here now is because it can make it very efficient for us, right? For our tax rate, we're gonna F4, 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 F4. And now for our multiples, we're just gonna come back here, F4, F4, that's all we have. And now for our minimum cash. We're just going to format paint that in and now we have all of this formatted properly and now we need to highlight this blue and hard code so this color right here you just go all hcm and then go to custom copy this number format and then we're going to go straight in and make it blue for hard code and for the number formats and also like like um the color formats i realized that a lot of times at work we're very used to using things like fact set where we use a macro and a change of the color like one of the things that I've had the a hard time doing is on my PC, like you just have to do these things manually, which makes it a little bit more difficult. But if you guys could do the test on your work computer, I would do it. But if you're on your PC, this is this is a way that I found that works for me. So now after we have the transaction assumptions set up, we're gonna be sort of setting up our entry assumptions. So on the PowerPoint, it says it's on a cash-free, debt-free basis, which means that essentially, you're just assuming that the transaction, the company is going to come with no cash and no debt. So essentially your enterprise value is going to be equal to your purchase price of equity. So you're, oh, I need to change my border colors. So your entry multiple, you're going to link it up here. It's going to be 12x. And then your EBITDA, we're gonna link that later once we project out the PNL. And then the thing here is that, like, I notice a lot of people when they do these things, they start with the PNL projections first. Like, you really don't need to. Like, you could sort of just just have this template. Just understand, like, every time you guys create a model, you guys have to do the transaction assumptions first, then do the entry assumptions first. Like, it takes a lot of the thinking out of it. So you guys spend less time thinking and more time on autopilot, just sort of populating a template that is already pre-created in your head. So for this one, we're going to do this. We're basically just going to sort of plug in around the formula, right? Because this will be linked to our PL projections once we get there. But for now, it's just going to be sort of blank number sheets for now. And after this, we're going to have our leverage assumptions, which is a part of our transaction assumptions, right? So you're going to have your debt type. Basically, I've already memorized this from my LBO model test to make things faster. Right? I'm going to have my leverage, my leverage in dollars my sort of fee in dollars, right? And then my fee percentages, and then my amortization years, my amortization dollars, my interest percentage for the debt, and then my amortization percentage. And this is principal amortization, so I'm just gonna 
annotated as P at more. And afterwards, you're just going to underline everything, center these. And then for your debt type, you're going to have two types of debt, right? You have your term loan and then your pick. We're not going to put revolver here just now because your revolver is assuming 0, 0.0 times at entry. So essentially just undrawn. So it doesn't impact your sources and uses at all. So we're just going to have this. And now for our leverage, let me see what we have in this PowerPoint. We have three times leverage. I'm just gonna copy this down so we just have the format. So we have three times leverage, 1.5 times pick, which accumulates and we're gonna pay it off at the end of the projection period. Our leverage dollars is we're gonna take this. It's gonna be leveraged off LTM EBITDA. So, so it's gonna be times your 2021 EBITDA figure. So multiply that down and then your fee I think it's a 2% fee, right? Yep, it's 2% underwriting fee. So I'm just gonna paste that here. And as you guys can see, like what I'm doing is that I'm just keeping everything linked. So at the end of the day, like once I do my PL projections, I could link this 2021 EBITDA into my PL. It's gonna auto populate everything rather than doing one piece and then coming back up. I mean, like both works, but essentially this works for me because it helps me sort of have a pre built template in my head that I just memorize. We have this, and then our app more years. It's going to come to your fees and sort of just divide by the amortization years, which is 10. And I realize I messed up here a little bit. This shouldn't be 10%, it should be an actual number. So, it's so you're just going to make sure it's anchored, drag down. Oh. I mean. divide by that now your interest i think on the powerpoint is going to be 10 percent not eight percent so we have an eight percent interest cash interest on the term loan and a 10 percent cash interest on the pick and then our principal amortization is one percent and then we have zero now we're going to add things up just for looks purposes and the way I'm doing this so quick is you just control one and then you tab in end, and then tab again and you just copy sort of the number code. I'm gonna add that in here, here, and then this should be good. Just changing the number code. So now after you guys have your leverage assumptions, the next step is to create your sources and uses. So now you're gonna have your sources. And then your uses is gonna be on column H, right? Because you're gonna have F, leave a space. Yep, so you're gonna have your uses here. And then in your sources, what you wanna do is you just wanna link up here. And then just hard code this. Total debt your sponsor equity injection, which is the amount of capital you're going to put in. But don't forget that there's also rollover sort of elements on this piece. So it's management rollover. And then you're going to have your total sources. Double bottom border. You're going to copy this, paste it here, change the names to uses. And now for your uses, you're going to have your purchase price of equity which is going to be equivalent to your enterprise value because it's cash-free, debt-free. And because it's cash-free, debt-free, you're not going to have like refinancing and net debt because it's assuming that there's no debt in cash in this transaction. It's just stripped out. So next off, you're going to have your transaction fees, financing fees, and minimum cash balance. And one of the things that I've noticed is that a lot of people sort of screw up the SNU area. Basically, what you guys need to remember is that there's only five variables in the uses for any LBO modeling test. Because essentially, if there's a time limit, you can't go that complex. And the five is always going to be your purchase price of equity, your refinancing of net debt, if you're not assuming debt-free, cash-free, your financing fees, and your minimum cash balance. And that's all you need. Once you count five or four, if it's cash-free, debt-free, that means you're set. If you're missing one, it's either your transaction fees or financing fees because some models don't have those. Just make sure that you're, not, you're missing it because it's not there, not because you omitted it because you forgot. 
So now after you do this, you're gonna link this up, right? So basically your total uses is just gonna be the sum of all your uses here. And your sources and uses always need to tie, right? Because whatever goes in needs to come out and be used. So your source is gonna be set equal to your uses. And then for your term loan, you're gonna link that to your leverage amount. You're gonna sum it up for your total debt. And now basically your sponsor equity is essentially gonna be the plug that balances your total sources with your uses. So whatever is remaining is gonna be your sponsor equity injection. But before we calculate that, we need to calculate the management rollover. And there's two types of management rollovers when it comes to modeling tests, right? There's one that says, okay, management rolls over 25%, so they own 25% of the company post-transaction, or they're rolling over a certain percentage of their proceeds, which is different. So in this case, they're rolling over 25% of their proceeds, which they've received, right? So typically in a private equity transaction, when a management team sells to a PE firm, usually they want you to roll over some equity so you still have a stake in the company, particularly in majority transactions and owner-backed companies. So basically we're rolling over 25% of our proceeds. So management, let's say they made $10 on a transaction, they, that's their liquidity event, they're gonna roll over 2.5, like 25% of that 10. So you're gonna say that 25% basically times the enterprise value because that's how much we're gonna pay and that's how much proceeds that they're getting. So they're rolling over 25% of that. And now your sponsor equity injection is gonna be the plug, right? So it's gonna be your total sources, minus your debt, minus your management rollover, and that's gonna balance out your sources and uses. And now with that said, we're gonna come over to the last piece before we go to our PL projections, which is your goodwill calculations. So here you're gonna start off with your purchase price of equity, less your book value of equity, which is provided on the balance sheet. Add your existing goodwill, if any, and then you're gonna have your equity step up. less your write-up of assets, add your deferred tax liabilities, and then you have your pro forma goodwill. Basically, for the purchase price of equity, you're gonna link it to your sources and uses. From this point on, you're gonna be linking a lot of things to your sources and uses to just keep things, like keep continuity between your file. So now your book value of equity, you're gonna leave that blank. We're gonna link it in for the balance sheet once we build it out. Existing goodwill, same thing with book value, we're gonna leave it out. And then your equity step up is gonna be this. Now your write-up of your assets is gonna be 10%, right? So you're essentially gonna take your 10% write-up, step up of your assets, and you're gonna times your equity step up. And basically the reason that this happens is that sometimes when you acquire a sort of goodwill, it just represents the intangible assets of a company, right? Whether it be your trademarks or sort of your brand name and things like that. Essentially when you're acquiring a company, you can also sort of write up the value of it, right? Like, oh, I don't think it's worth $10. I think it's worth 11, right? So you wrote it up by 10. But the issue now is that like every time you write up an asset, it's worth more. So you have like sort of a deferred tax liability that you need to pay forward because there's a difference between your booked and your cash taxes. So you're gonna take your tax rate and you're gonna multiply it, oops, by your write-up of your assets. Essentially, it's gonna be a negative. I'm gonna sum these up. And now that's gonna be your goodwill calculation. And after this, in the next part of the video, I'm gonna walk you guys through how to ultimately sort of project out the PL, the balance sheet, the cash flow, and link it back up to the starting assumption point so that your sources and uses will automatically populate.